please welcome <laughs> Pavel Rusnak, which uh, is currently uh, developing a uh, Tresor with a colleague of his. He himself is uh, a co-founder co of Brim Labs and a Fab Lab in Prague. Uh, his uh, colleague, I think, is the one who, who invented uh, shared Bitcoin mining, pooled Bitcoin mining. And today they will uh, show us a secure uh, device for storing or actually authenticating Bitcoin uh, transactions called Tresor. <clears throat> So thank you for the introduction, and I will try to reintroduce uh, our team uh, again. So uh, you might recognize the guy on the left. It was uh, mentioned it's uh, Marek Palatinus, also known as Slash, uh, inventor of, uh, pool, uh, of mining pool concept, and also operator of the first uh, mining pool, which is still one of the biggest, uh, with around 10% uh, of uh, hash rate on a Bitcoin network. Uh, he also invented uh, Stratum protocol, which is currently used in uh, miners, pools, and uh, in uh, Bitcoin clients. And the guy on the left is me, Pavel Rusnak, and I'm responsible for some smaller Bitcoin projects, uh, like, for example, coinmap.org. And uh, uh, together we form with uh, Alena, who is sadly not in the photo, a company called uh, Satoshi Labs. And we try to uh, have something like an umbrella uh, organization for these Bitcoin related projects. Uh, one of the most important problems in uh, Bitcoin uh, mass adoption is uh, security and safety of uh, Bitcoin private keys. By security, I mean uh, the security of the end user's computer, because we have uh, compromised computers with uh, viruses and malwares uh, and keyloggers. Uh, we also uh, have, for example, uh, in the Internet Cafe computers we don't trust. And what's not very common nowadays, but may be common in future, are rigged clients, which uh, look like uh, the regular clients, but they do something uh, they are not supposed to do. And by safety of uh, Bitcoin private keys, uh, we mean uh, uh, data uh, or par more particularly wallet loss during uh, various disasters, uh, hard drive failures, uh, naive reinstalls of operating system and also uh, failing to do proper backups, uh, which is uh, very easy, for example, in Bitcoin QT, where not a lot of uh, users are aware that uh, you have to backup your wallet uh, regularly, otherwise you will lose your Bitcoins. And solution to this, uh, we think, is hardware wallets. Uh, hardware wallet ideas is, idea is not uh, new. Uh, first, uh, I encountered this idea during a Bitcoin conference in Prague in 2011, when Clement Skep uh, introduced uh, us to his uh, project of hardware wallet. Sadly, uh, he didn't pursue uh, with his uh, students uh, the, this, uh, this idea of Arduino-based hardware wallet further. And uh, after Bitcoin conference uh, 2012 in London, we decided with Slash to uh, create a project that is now, now known as Trezor to actually bring this hardware wallet idea to life. We decided to follow the uh, keep it simple principle. So we are building a USB gadget, more particularly a human interface device. Uh, it has an OLED display and uh, OK cancel buttons, which require physical interaction with user to confirm or discard transaction. And we don't have batteries uh, be because we use just uh, power from the USB. And uh, we don't have radio like Bluetooth or wireless because we aim to uh, focus on the security of Bitcoin uh, transaction, not, uh, not mobility, which is quite good nowadays. What's inside of Trezor? Uh, we have uh, our views ARM Cortex M3 microcontroller, uh, more particularly STM32F205, uh, uh, clocked at 120 megahertz, 
Uh, it has half a megabyte of flash uh, for code, uh, 128 kilobytes of RAM, and uh, hardware random generator, which I will talk a little bit uh, in, uh, later. And it has uh, OLED display, which is more or less one, one, one inch wide. During the development, we also created a Raspberry Pi shield, which uses uh, the same uh, display. Sadly, Raspberry Pi can't act as a USB client device, uh, just as USB host. So we had to put an extra USB to serial converter chip uh, on board. And this shield was used as a prototyping platform during uh, development phase because that allowed us to use Python instead of C and to quickly, uh, quickly try some stuff before uh, implementing, it, implementing it in much lower level C. And the good thing is that this uh, Raspberry Pi this shield follows the same logic as the real uh, Trezor device. So client has uh, no way to determine if there is a real device or Raspberry Pi shield on the other side. So let me give you an overview how Trezor works. First, we have to generate uh, initial ent entropy, and we want to allow its easy backup. Then we use this entropy to derive master private key and master public key. Uh, I call them generators because with these uh, master keys, you are able to generate uh, basically an infinite number of private keys and uh, corresponding public keys and addresses. And if you send this master public key to computer, uh, it uh, immediately knows which addresses are there available to be spent. And uh, because uh, of that, computer can then prepare transactions and send them to Trezor. But these transactions are, uh, are not having signatures because computer doesn't know the private keys. It just fills, uh, fill in, fills in the gaps with uh, key indices. And then Trezor uh, can use master private key to generate uh, these uh, private, uh, needed private keys from these indices. Uh, if the user confirms the transaction, then uh, it's signed using these keys, sent back to computer, and it can broadcast it to the network like it would normally do. The main idea behind this is that private keys never leave the device because they are generated inside of the device. And uh, even during the signature, there is no reason to why they should go out. So how do we generate entropy? We use hardware random generator uh, to, cr to create uh, internal entropy A. Uh, we can request external entropy from, from computer. And then we uh, use both entropies to generate final entropy. And uh, if we commit to entropy a before receiving entropy B, we can prove that the external uh, entropy was used, for example, with this very simple scheme. Uh, more complex schemes were suggested by Timo Hanke and Ilya Gerhardt, where you, for example, by uh, publishing half of the final entropy, you could say for 90% that uh, external entropy was used, and you can uh, increase this percentage by uh, re revealing more and more bits from uh, from this final entropy. So we have this entropy, which is basically uh, 128 or 256 bits, and we want to somehow uh, make them available for backup. So we use something that's called mnemonic code, uh, which is heavily uh, inspired by what uh, Thomas did in his Electrum client. The idea is simple. We split these uh, bits into a chunk of uh, 11 bits. We have a word list of uh, 248 words. We interpret each uh, this chunk as an integer between 0 and 247 and use uh, the, uh, the word from word list uh, to, to create the sentence. Uh, we, we, can, we could use entropy directly to generate the master private key but we decided to do something more complex and standardize it as a mnemonic code BIP39. Uh, so what we do is we use uh, PBKDF2 to generate master private key. 
it, it, it's a construct that uses pseudo-random function uh, HMAC uh, SHA-512. Uh, we use password, as a password, we use mnemonic sentence, and we solved it with a string mnemonic concatenated with user secret. And that allows us to create something like password protected uh, mnemonics. So the idea is you, you write down these uh, 12 or 25 words uh, on a paper, put it uh, in a safe, and uh, if, if, even if uh, someone uh, steals this paper, uh, he doesn't have your uh, master private key because he has to provide uh, this user secret uh, if, if it was used. And also a nice side effect is that it provides uh, plausible deniability because if you, uh, if you give some different user secret to an attacker, he would obtain a different master private key and completely different set of addresses. And if you are clever enough to send some small amounts of bitcoins to these fake addresses, he can never know that you gave him a right or wrong uh, user secret. We use 496 iteration, and desired key length is uh, 512 uh, 12 bits. That's because uh, there is another standard called hierarchical de deterministic wallets, which uh, use exactly 512 bits for its master node. And the idea is that uh, using that construct, uh, you could <coughs> create basically a tree of uh, of addresses, and each level can uh, can be some logical way how to uh, the, how to divide these addresses into logical groups. So, for example, uh, the first level would be your wallets. Second level would be your different wallet chains, like for example, main addresses and uh, change addresses. And the third level would be actual addresses of that kind. And the function that generates uh, uh, level one from level zero is called uh, ch child key derivation function, and it takes uh, data from parent node and uh, index, uh, index zero one uh, to create different, different uh, childs of that particular node. And then you can descend deeper and deeper in the tree, and uh, you have some logical structure in your addresses, so it's not like it's uh, flat. Uh, the, the, this derivation function uses also HMAC SHA-512, and it was designed by uh, Peter C. Pavule, uh, and it's standardized as BIP32. And because it's a very abstract concept, it provides lots of possibilities. Uh, the first one I described on the previous slide, but uh, you can, for example, have a first level as a representation of different coin types, like, for example, uh, uh, first node would be Bitcoin addresses, second node Litecoin addresses, and so on, and then you would follow this logical structure deeper. Or you have some even more complex setup. Uh, imagine there is a company that has uh, headquarters and local branches all around the world, and uh, this uh, key that happens to be a headquarter uh, key can derive all, all keys uh, in all branches all around the world. But if you are a director of a local branch, you have access, access just to uh, addresses uh, only uh, happen, that, that uh, happened in your, in your branch. What's even cooler, we can push this concept even further and uh, use First, uh, first node in level one for crypto coins, uh, second, uh, second node in level one for generating SSH keys, uh, another node for generating full disk encryption keys, and uh, next node for ge generating challenge response keys, which can happen in, uh, if you have some intelligent door to your house or maybe even to start your car. And that's very cool because suddenly your wallet token happens to be identity token. You can do pretty much everything you, 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 you can. Another problem we found or uh, tackled uh, is that ECDCA uh, signatures uh, require random nonce during signing. For Bitcoin, it's uh, 256 bits. 
And uh, if you use the same nonce twice for signing different messages, uh, you, using the same particular key, you would basically leak this key. This was demonstrated on 27C3 fail overflow talk about console hacking, how they got the PS3 uh, private key. And uh, sadly, it was also exploited in August 2013, where there was uh, Android Java random number generator vulnerability in secure random class, which didn't use uh, enough entropy to generate these uh, nonces. And more than uh, 59 bitcoins were stolen. What's, what was uh, even worse was that all, uh, all Android clients were affected because the, the bug was uh, in, the, in the shared library be, below uh, the application code. And also, it, uh, even if you imported your own private key uh, into uh, Android wallet, you, you were not safe because the problem was uh, during generating nonces for signatures, not during generating the private keys. So, uh, coincidentally, in August, same year, uh, RFC 6979 was uh, released uh, with implementation in Java and Go. Uh, later, we ported this idea to Python ECDCA uh, with Slash, and it was merged in uh, uh, 0.9 release. And the idea is you don't use uh, random nonds for signature, but uh, you generate uh, these uh, bit, bits with uh, HMAC uh, deterministic random bit generator, which is seeded with private key and message. So it can, cannot happen that you uh, sign two different messages with the same particular key uh, using the same nonce. And it was great news for us because that avoided the problem. It enabled us to do unit tests, which weren't possible before. And now, suddenly, we could, uh, we could see that Trezor is doing uh, the, the correct thing uh, for during signing. And also, what was important, uh, that allowed us to prove that Trezor do, uh, doesn't leak master private key in nonce, because you, you could create such a scheme that would do that. And let me tell you something about integration. In order to be Trezor usable, we need to integrate it into existing desktop clients. So work is being done uh, in the multibit by multibit guys. And uh, this multibit uses Bitcoin J and Trezor J library. Uh, and uh, Electrum and Armory uh, clients, which are written in Python, which we are really fond of with uh, Marek. <clears throat> Uh, sadly, Bitcoin QT is pretty complex code base, and we uh, currently have no uh, immediate goal to, to implement Trezor support into it. And also, upstream is probably not very hesitant to uh, is, is, is a little bit hesitant to, to do such big changes in their code base. Uh, the good thing about mobile clients, particularly in Android, is that most of new Android phones have USB OTG, which uh, allows them to communicate with uh, USB devices. And because Multibit is written in Java, they can pretty reuse most of the code base uh, that, uh, that, is, uh, that was written for Multibit. And also what we are working right now is a native browser plugin which will create a bridge between uh, low-level USB communication with Trezor to JavaScript, so web wallets can actually use uh, Trezor via JavaScript bindings. And that would allow to finally create uh, safe uh, web wallets because there would be no uh, private keys stored on the server. So I think that's it. If you want to contact us, there is this uh, email. Please put uh, 30C3 in a subject so I know it uh, came from this conference. Uh, most of the source code is uh, published on GitHub. We will, release, uh, uh, we will release a firmware source code in uh, January when uh, we, will ship, uh, we will ship most of the pre-orders. And if there are any questions, I'm willing to answer them right now. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I, I, I can show them if, if they want. If they want. Can, I have, can I have three, three minutes or so? It's okay. I think one minute is okay. But I, okay. Mm -hmm. okay, then. So I, I can show you, uh, be before you line up in a, at a microphone, I can show you some early prototype from, uh, from September. So it, it looks like this. Uh, it's a metallic version, which uh, is more or less final. We will be doing some uh, polishing touches to, to the version that will be shipped in January. And <laughs> <laughs> OK, I don't know if you see it. And it's just just a demo screen because that's the firmware back from September, so that the, there is uh, there is some demo demo transaction, and I can either confirm it or cancel it. And if I confirm it, then it's just some animation doing the signing, and so that's how it looks. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, you already know the drill. Please line up uh, behind the microphones. So, you have a question at number three. Please go right ahead. Um, yes, I was wondering if your your hardware wallet uh, supports other types of uh, complex transactions like uh, in out of M transactions and such. Mm -hmm. In the first firmware we will be releasing uh, in uh, January, there won't be such feature. But because we have a firmware update uh, possibility, we definitely want to include multi-signature in the next version of firmware. And probably some more complex, complex transaction types. Are there any questions from IRC? Yes, one, please. Um, it look, look like uh, the person, perfect solution for uh, ATM usage. Um, do you think maybe uh, Bitcoin ATM machines are uh, integrate uh, it with some popular ATM machines in the future? Um, I think it should, should be possible to integrate it with ATM in the future. There well, ATM is more or less common computer nowadays, so I, I see no reason why we, we shouldn't go that way. Uh, but um, if, if, because we don't have any Bluetooth or radio, uh, the first uh, version would have to support USB, but maybe in, in the future there will be some, some other ways. Number one, please. Mm, what happens with uh, uh, Bitcoin stored on the uh, device when it breaks? Uh, then uh, you would uh, recover your paper wallet with these 12 or 24 words. And using this uh, backup, you can recover it into other Trezor device or just use software that's compatible with BIP39 and send your Bitcoins to other, other address. So that, that's the main purpose of these paper wallet backups. Mm -hmm. Next question from number four, please. Hi, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, Thanks. I saw on the website the pre orders are closed. Uh, do you have an idea when you will be taking orders again? Uh, we uh, will be shipping Trezor to pre order people in January, and after all these pre orders are shipped, we will reopen Trezor for regular sale. So, um, in February? <laughs> well, af after we are done, so most probably in February, right? Thank you. Number one, please. Are you thinking about another version where you have maybe a power supply within the device and then you could transfer the transactions via Bluetooth or something, which would be more convenient maybe for, for later uses? The problem is if we want to have radio in Trezor, we would need to have a battery and other stuff, and it's it looks simple, but it's adding more and more complexity. I'm not saying we are not going to go this way, but the first version. Yeah, of course, not. it's the first version. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We, we will see how how market will 
uh, response. It's still a new, it's still a new area for for us and for everybody. So maybe it will be needed, maybe it won't. We'll see. It would be nice, but the first version is already very well. Thank you lots. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you. Another question from number four, please. Yes. Um, so you talked about update functionality. How do you prevent? any kind of update functionality from compromising the device, obviously, when you plug it in an untrusted system like a uh, web shop, uh, like mm -hmm. an internet cafe, or the aforementioned ATM machine. All right. What uh, we, we have a bootloader that contains uh, our uh, public keys. And all firm, uh, our firmware is signed by us. And if, if the signature uh, is, isn't correct, then Trezor will print that you are running unofficial firmware. So you can build your own firmware, but you will have uh, to confirm this warning in order to run it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, many of you are trying to find seats for the next talk, but please, I know it's hard, try not to queue up the walkways. Um, any more questions from IRC, maybe? Okay. Hmm. Huh? Then thank you for the talk. Thank you for inviting me.